For those of you, I think almost everyone here knows Leah Feldman. Those of you who do not will hear her now. She's come right now from New Haven, but her home base is the University of Chicago. And she has been a member of our masthead three years Yes. now. And um, is contributing substantially in very important ways. And fortunately, we'll be at our next meeting too in the fall, which will be on philology. And um, so I'm very glad to welcome you to this reprise of the Pink Issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for having me, bringing me um, onto this issue. I'm very honored. And thank you so much for your hospitality. Um, and thank you so much for this thought provoking talk. I am now going to perform in the, in the shadow of it. So, um, but I hope that there's some set up some dialogue there. Um, so the, glo the Global South is more than a place, it's a set of relations, a political consciousness an idea, a sense of longing, which hovers so closely above, seemingly without touching the fundamental question of Soviet post-coloniality. The Kyrgyz author and statesman Chinggis Atmatov, writing in 1958 on the periphery of the former Soviet Union before the emergence of the Kyrgyz nationalism, an Algerian poet and statesman Malik Haddad, writing a year later amidst, amidst the Algerian War of Independence, engage with poetry and song in their novels as popular expressions of a longing for solidarity that resists populist nationalist ideologies. The structure of the novels, cast as stories within stories, offer a reorientation of the boundaries of, of alignment. While Haddad and Atmatov never met, their love stories intersect in the French communist press. These literary intersections that cross global souths expose a history of institutional, personal, and textual networks that, dis that persisted despite often tense ideological divide between Soviet-aligned and non-aligned nations. In so doing, produced two genealogies of anti-imperial thinking that are often not reconciled. Um, uh, these are the non-aligned Bandung and the lesser known Soviet affiliate cousin, the Afro-Asian Writers Association, which are, are pictured here. A singular global south that forgets the question of alignment at the disciplinary level, threatens a narrowing scope of decolonial literature as global anglophone, a ploy of the neoliberal university to absorb various studies, multiculturalism into conglomerate English or modern language departments, threatening minority language study and philological training. In turn, the historical consequences of such disciplinary actions include the reproduction of a singular decolonial narrative locked around a Euro-American vision of empire and the 1968 post-Marxist deconstructive theoretical trajectory. However, beyond their historical intersections, the idea of alignment invites a necessary corrective to a monolithic understanding of the material aesthetics of decolonial literatures, perhaps most obviously framed in the divide between socialist and magical realisms. The idea of global south then explores the role of materialist aesthetics in shaping forms of transnational humanist affiliation that take into account the historical formations of discourse uh, discourses of race and ethnicity and their intersections across Soviet and decolonial Souths. The confluence of opposing systems of power stress, expressed by the aligned and non-aligned formation Global Souths challenges the singular East-West and North-South oppositions generated through Cold War geopolitics. The blind spot created by these static orientations has most troublingly resulted in, on the one hand, universalist displacements of race, and on the other, new nationalist claims to traditional traditionalist values and a challenge to the uncontested global dominance of neoliberalism, the emergence of the new right. Focusing on close readings of encounters, entanglements, and exchanges that produce new visions of political commitment and on and across transnational borders, I argue um, engages a less visible and necessary historical account of the formation of decolonial literatures. And of course, this project in turn entails exposing the role of Soviet post-colonial, or the Soviet post-colonial periphery um, in contributing to the formation of the literature of decolonization, both aesthetically um, as well as through its instit institutional linkages. So, 
Edward Said's traveling theory reconsidered can be can read as a mark as as marking a beginning of an effort to recuperate aligned and non-aligned connections across global south in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. For Said, the question of alignment is taken up in the discussion of affiliation. He writes, of course, to speak here only of borrowing and adaptation is not act adequate. There is a particular and intellectual and perhaps moral community of remarkable kind, affiliation in the deepest and most interesting sense of the word. His revival of affiliation at once speaks to the cultivation of a community of transnational literary text, ideas traveling in exile, and the history of global solidarities between the line and non-aligned political networks. He turns to Lukács' reification in the context of revolutionary Budapest as an inducement to insurrectionary action and a crucial expansion of the Marxist-Hegelian dialectic encompassing an extraordinary widespread infection of all human life. What is at stake here is not Lukács' reification, not only Lukács' reification, but the materialization of the links that bind it to the history of Soviet anti-imperialism through the particular moment of its inscription, and more importantly, the very idea of alignment lay bare in Fanon's reading of Lukács. For Said, Fanon's reception of the Lukácsian subject, object, antimony as a European cultural import resituates the Hegelian dialectic within the history and geography of colonial Algeria and the revolutionary violence of the independent struggle. In 1958, Fanon writes at the moment of the Soviet Union's realignment with the Afro-Asian anti-imperial solidarity. Nikita Khrushchev's renewed orientation toward the international anti-imperialist networks responded both to the show of Gandong solidarity in 55 and the global outcry against Soviet imperialism after the Hungarian re uh, rebellion in 56. Returning to the outward looking policies of the Soviet Eastern International in the 20s, and this is what this graphic depicts, Khrushchev then again began new international linkages across the decolonizing Afro-Asian world, hailing a zone of peace across the socialist world and the uncommitted states, that is the non-aligned third world. Lukács is writing from 58, um, realism in our time reflects a shifting understanding of align alignment following two major events, his exile in Tashkent during the war and his support of the 56 uprising, which resulted in his own expulsion from the party. In contrast to his exploration of reification through the synthesis of the class consciousness of the proletariat, as an insider in 23, as an outsider in 1958, he instead emphasizes the ways in which socialist realism formulated the boundaries of alignment through an insistence on both the place of transcription and transcendence of space. Lukács argues that socialist realism is distinguished from critical realism, quote, not only in being based in a concrete socialist perspective, but also in using this perspective to describe the forces working towards socialism from the inside. This inside method, he continues, seeks to discover an Archimedean point in the midst of social contradictions and then base its typology on an analysis of these contradictions. The perspective of socialism, Lukács concludes, enables the writer to see society and history for what they are. Lukács relies on a spatial discourse in which perspective serves as a system for organizing the space of socialist realism and through it uh, um, the visibility of history. Love poetry as a genre has played a central role in the aligned and non-aligned movement and offers a window into the formation of decolonial humanist aesthetics. And here I'm going to invoke um, Amir Mufti, who is not here, who takes up the, the ghazals, or love ballads, of the Urdu poet, Afro-Asian writer and Lotus Prize winner Faiz Ahmed Faiz. In the context of the partition of India, Mufti argues that Faiz's poetry marks the departure from the personal love of the old ghazal, a devotion to the longing for a spiritual beloved, the embodiment of a hidden truth and beauty that cannot be captured into the love of a people, articulating a major shift in the conception of poetry not only as part of a spiritual tradition, but a material historical production. Mufti writes that this is a, 
a, quote, a staging of selfhood that takes division seriously, refusing to treat it merely as a phenomenon in the, union, in the unity and diversity formula of Indian nationalism. It suggests, in fact, the division, the inf indefinitely extended separation from the beloved <coughs> constitutes the very ground from which union can be contemplated. Division serves as a constitutive feature of wholeness that animates the lyric subject in Faiz's work. Taking up this vision of poetic longing as division, I expose a material vision of the love story to articulate a poetics of separation and longing across alignment, which envision political action beyond both an internationalist totality and statist nationalism. The project builds on forthcoming work on the, the Bandung Conference in 55, the Afro-Asian Writers Association and its associated journal Lotus, as well as the related CIA organization, Congress for Cultural Freedom. And on the Soviet side of these organizations, as the, um, the Gorky Institute of World Literature, P Patrice Lumumba's Un People's University, and the Garasimov Cine Cinema Institute of the Geek, and most notably the Afro-Asian Writers Association and um, the Afro-Asian and Latin American uh, film conferences, which were both held across the former Soviet periphery and Middle East from 58 through roughly 89 in the case of the film conference. The famous Kenyan writer and decolonial thinker Nguyua Tiango remembered the 67 and 73 Afro-Asian Congresses in, held in Beirut and Alma-Athia, <coughs> and particularly Lotus's debut in 68 as a turning point which influenced his conception of literature, and he notes um, motivated him, his renaming of the English department at the University of Nairobi to the literature department in 69, when he expanded the curriculum to include um, writers who have participated um, in the Congresses. In the Kazakh Soviet Republic, where he accepted the Lotus Prize alongside attendees, including Osman Sambani, Alex Laguma, Katab Yassin, and others, he remembers, in addition to a very elaborate horse meat wolf that he was served, becoming aware of the extent to which the Soviet Union encompassed Asia, these are his words, and fascinated by the language question, the relationship between Russia and local national languages, as well as the visible differences between Kazakhs and Russians. In his award acceptance, which was published um, in, in Lotus, uh, this issue on, the, on your left, um, in, in an address called The Links That Bind, Afro-Asian Solidarity, he cites um, W.E.B. W. Du Bois' Dusk, Dusk of Dawn, um, and Du Bois had been present at the first Congress. There was a photo in the last um, slide in 58. Well, while conceding that, quote, um, and this is in Gugi, the ties of geography are easier to see. The shared experience of the past, a shared hope for the future, these then are the most enduring links that bind the African peoples of the continent and, and in diaspora with those of Asia. The speech then concludes with a series of intertextual links to, quote, the links that bind us to the words of the Kazakh poet, Abai Kunambaya, Vietnamese poet Du Bon, and the verse of Sam Bene. For Ngugi, it's not the geopolitics of these institutional networks, but rather a shared experience generated through um, these linkages that bind the decolonial struggle, which make visible both the sense of history and a sort of speculative futurity. Um, in Dusk of Dawn, Du Bois frames the, his personal autobiography within a larger vision of Pan-African history. Um, in Pan-Africanism in this invocation, <coughs> at moments seems to reject a biological conception of race, what he terms a relatively unimportant badge of color. Instead, he argues that the children of Asia and Africa Yellow, the children of Africa, Yellow Asia, and into the South Seas are joined in the kinship of the social heritage of slavery. Revisiting these theoretical travels through the question of alignment allows for a re-territorialization of decolonial theory, which, as Fanon argues, grounds solidarity in the materiality of the history of race. Fanon writes, it's at the heart of national consciousness that the international consciousness establishes itself and thrives. However, the subject of love and longing also returns the focus of the individual subjective element at the heart of affiliation 
building on, on Du Bois's pan-African um, uh, vision of kinship of, as a social history. Um, this set of affiliations emerges not through, in, in Googie's speech, not through institutional networks assembled in Lotus, but in, in, in the utterance that binds us to the words of, of the poetry of these, um, of the other poets who are featured there. So, in 1958, Atmatov published his first novel, Jamelia, in Russian and Kyrgyz. A year later, the French communist writer, Louis Aragon, translated it into French, putting the novel into international distribution. Jamelia reflects a worldly socialist realist intention marked by Atmatov's tenure at the Gorky Institute of World Literature, whose most notable writers and residents included Libyan author Ibrahim Alkouni, Abkhazian author Fazil Iskander, and the theorist Mikhail Bakhtin, earlier in the 20s, of course. Bakhtin's rediscovery in the 50s among the students at Gorky coincided with a series of discussions about broadening the aesthetics of socialist realism as an artistic form of thought. As a way of reclaiming the humanist project of socialist realism outside the form of Soviet state building, um, and this is this is his recovery in '50 because basically he, his works have been completely abandoned at, at this point, and Atmatov is is at Gorky at this moment of this of this reclaiming of Bakhtin, which also coincides with. Um, the opening of all of these organizations, the Afro-Asian Association and various institutes. Then shortly after Akhmatov's ten um, tenure at Gorky, Jamelia recounts a young woman's controversial decision to elope with her lover, who she meets working on a delivery line transporting grain while her husband is at war. The love story is framed around the narrator's own coming of age, chronicling his passage to adulthood and path to becoming a painter. The narrative's frame story highlights what is often described as a Stalinist master plot, an ideological buildings roman in which the hero's transformation occurs through the physical completion of a task in the public sphere and the psychic awareness of his or her socio-political consciousness. In this sense, a Kunstler roman, the love intrigue, is represented as one of the narrator's paintings. The painting, in turn, dramatizes the interplay between artistic representation and reality. Jamelia begins with the narrator's contemplation of his completed canvas, which prompts him to retrace the love story from the edges of its frames. Once again, I stand in front of the, paint, the small painting in a simple frame. Tomorrow morning, I have to leave for the village, and I gaze long and intently at the canvas, as if it could give me a kind of parting word. I've still not exhibited the painting. Moreover, when relatives from the village come to visit, I hide it away. There is nothing shameful in it, but it's far from being a work of art. It's plain, just like the plain earth depicted in it. The footprints of the two travelers stretch across a washed out track. The further they go, the fainter the road they appear, and it seems as if the travelers themselves take, an up, take another step. They will exit the frame. One of them, however, I'm rushing a bit ahead. Akhmatov distinguishes the private sentimental function of the painting as object from the formal artistic criteria required of an obdazitsa a model or specimen of art, that is a public sanctioned example of official style of so socialist realism. However, the painting's failure to qualify as art also lends it material value as a catalyst for the narrator's path to adulthood and the love story of Jamelia. This tension between the painting as object and subject is emphasized by its reflection of the natural landscape, both formally and conceptually. It's plain, just like the plain earth depicted in it. Ona prosta kak prosta zemla obrajenia na nje. The narrator's gaze falls upon the footprints of the two travelers, whose steps seem to come to life. Atmatov's punctuation blurs the distance between the representation and reality, and then dash both linking and separating the traveler's path from the painting's frame. Indeed, the, moment, the, the movement of the traveler is also echoed in the narrator's account, as he notes, I'm running ahead of the events of the story. The narrative itself thus further replicates the painting's artistic and non-artistic qualities, its representational function, as well as its materiality. The setting of the novel, as well as its structure, story of a painting within a story, emphasizes the competing perspectives that confuse the relationships among narrative worlds. 
This section also references an aesthetic debate um, that began in the 1920s identifying the role of art in gendering comradely relations. The materiality of the figurative realist painting has a poetic quality, which, like Bakhtin's notion of novelistic discourse, and resonates with the viewer's perception of the world. And this is coming out of his engagement with, with the a, a discourse surrounding figurative painting during the, uh, and, and in the early um, revolutionary moment, in, right after the revolution in, in 19. Outlining the relationship between ethics and aesthetics, Bakhtin argues that art generates one's ethical responsibility, one's answerability to life. The literary word's responsibility draws on the tension between an ethical accountability and a form of dialogue. Bakhtin writes, I have to answer with my own life for what I've experienced and understood in art, so that everything I've experienced and understood would not remain ineffectual in my life. Art and life are not one, but they must become united in myself, in the unity of my answerability. In this sense, literature serves as a meaningful organization of experience, as, as that which makes experience intelligible. And the, the concept of experience here is coming from, is, is, uh, the etymology is to pass, to pass through life, or to, pere, pere means, is the, means moving through, and then jivani is, is, is life. So, um, so he's, he's drawing on um, this very particular understanding of the relationship between, um, uh, between uh, uh, the, po the experience of, of, of poetic reading and, um, and existence. The empathetic, the empath empathetic response of the viewer facilitated by, this, by the materiality of the poetic in this incarnation thus generates a sense of comradely social relations. Um, and for Ekmatov, crucially, this aesthetic discussion is filtered through Bakhtin's Renaissance at Gorky again. So I'd like to add here that this notion of Perejuvania um, as central to a poetic materiality has been taken up in the recanonization of historical poetics most recently. And um, I don't have time to get into this here, but in the longer version, I exploring the um, well, I'm, 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 I'm departing from this usage of historical poetics, um, what has become a reading for, I think, universalizing a very Euro and Russo-centric patriarchal canon. And instead, I'm evoking an alternative reading of Atmatov's engagement with Bakhtinian humanism, which materializes another inside as an artistic form of thought that contends with precisely the Soviet Orientalist imagination of the East and its universalization of this notion of poetic experience that's mobilized in historical poetics. Jamili and Dani are fall in love while fulfilling their comradely <coughs> duties hauling grain to the shipyards. However, it's Danyar's songs and their walks home that bring the two together. An orphan raised in a Kazakh village, Danyar returns to the Kyrgyz village of his birth after he's disabled in combat. His songs, which inspired Jamilia's love and the narrator's artistic talents are themselves hybrids and resist the Soviet national, international dialectic. Atmatov writes, Danyar's music had absorbed the best melodies of, from two native peoples and interwove them in his own way into a unique and unrepeatable song. This was a song of the mountains and the steppes, at one soaring clearly like the Kyrgyz mountains and then spreading freely like the Kazakh steppes. The folk song reflects its natural landscape, Stilushaya, which evokes a, a botanical lexicon, but one that does not progress into a kind of universalizing totality in the way that I argue um, uh, this reading of historical poetics does, relies on, a, on an evolutionary discourse. The it, emphasis is not placed on the artist's role in crafting a hybrid work, but rather on the music itself, which absorbed the two melodies and wove them together. It does not produce a single homogeneous Soviet whole, but rather an expression, he writes, of a great love, the life, and the land. Atmatov's novel was translated by Aragon through his press, Les Editeurs Français Réunis, which published Soviet literature in French and also recommended French and Francophone publications for the USSR. Aragon describes socialist realism as an act of translation, as the project of the committed artist to reawaken an inner conflict of history through which individuals can transform themselves beyond the dictates of their given social conditions. 
and he introduces Jamelia with an allusion to Kipling alongside several European classic love stories as the most beautiful love story in the world. <laughs> The strength of the novel, he writes, lies in the fact that as readers we learn of an unknown country from within by beings for whom all of this is natural and requires no explication. <laughs> he highlights the tension between literature's capacity to embody an immediate experience for the reader that exceeds description, and his emphasis on consciousness as the determining feature of literature's political force echoes Lukács' vision of socialist realism as a revelation of history from within. Atzmatov's novel is uniquely positioned within multiple insides. Officially, Jamelia's master plot exposes Danyar and Jamelia's love, both as in the moment of state's artistic awakening and through the materiality of this brushwork, again, which is expressed in this opening passage. However, its vision of the steppe also highlights another inside Atmatov's experience as a Rus Soviet Russophone Kyrgyz writer. Furthermore, Aragon's translation and imagines, um, if, if failing to do so, an encounter with the characters of Atmatov's novel as if real people who bring the wartime Kyrgyz steppe of 1943 to a contemporary Paris shaken by the return of de Gaulle and the Algerian War. In 1959, a year after the French publication of Jamelia, Aragon's friend and fellow Marxist poet, Malik Hadad, publishes his novel, Je t'offre une gazelle, which I'm going to translate as, I, I present you a gazelle, emphasizing this intertwining play here in the title with tense and temporality, representation of gifts. The novel, Another Story Within a Story, recounts an unnamed Algerian's authors failed attempts to publish a novel in Paris during the war. A Marxist poet and teacher, Haddad, received his formal education in France where he penned the novel before returning to Algeria after the war to serve in the Ministry of Culture. Haddad's nationalism, like Akhmatov's, is not aligned with the International Communist Party. For Haddad, nationalism rather provides a mode of resistance to French imperial ties to global capitalism. However, it's a self-annihilating nationalism in the vein of Said's traveling theory, and in this way, Haddad's novel's worldliness is also shaped by an intention and commitment to a, a supranational Arabo-Persian uh, poetic tradition. Like Atmatov, Haddad structures his novel within a novel as a love story set in um, a home rendered strange in its French inscription. Um, a young man, Moulet, attempts to capture a gazelle to win the affection of his beloved Yaminata. The gazelle of classical poetry signifies the beloved beauty, spiritual knowledge, and the impossibility of its apprehension. The gazelle also appears in Hadith as professing the Tawhid, or the primacy of God and the Prophet, the hunt for the gazelle, and the impossibility of its living capture as a model for affiliated belonging, thus frames the author's struggle to reconcile his writing in French um, amidst the war. Haidat's novel is set in the present moment amidst the divided Marxist politics of 58 Paris. He describes his divided linguistic consciousness as a form of self-translation. He writes, even in expressing oneself in French, the Algerian writers of Berbo Arab origin translate a specifically Algerian idea an idea that would have found the fullness of its expression had, if it had been transported, vehiculé, by an Arabic language and literature. Again, in Fanonian form, Hadad's divided linguistic consciousness does not lead to the impossibility of communication, but rather to its unrealized possibility in the mode, mode de transport of translation. For Haddad, as for Fanon, language renders visible the material imprint of the colonial history on the psyche. In this sense, I distinguish a surrealist Im impulse to destabilize meaning from a conception of literature's capacity to realize social connections, or again, comradely <coughs> relations um, in, in the other form. In uh, Je trouverai une gazelle, the gazelle is both the classical poetic form, or gazelle, and incarnation of the beloved or divine embodies the struggle to communicate between languages and cross texts. In the author's story, Moulet dreams of killing the gazelle, but while awake, she speaks to him, instructing him to abandon his hopes of trapping her and to believe in her existence. This encounter with the speaking gazelle alludes to a hadith in which the prophet realizes a gazelle as it affirms the shahada, that is the act of witnessing God. 
The gazelle confirms the oneness and truth of God with her recitation of the Tawheed, there is no God but God. And in Hadad's text, the gazelle's existence is affirmed through a belief in the capacity of the words. Here we are. The gazelle approached Mule, say what you will. Maybe it was a true gazelle, maybe it was a true gazelle that was not real. I don't know how to translate this in any way that makes sense. That said was always true, the real words of the gazelle. You'd have to be mad to want to capture me, Mule. You have to believe in me, but not follow me. You have to be mad to want to capture me, Mule. The paradoxical statement that the gazelle is both real and unreal, or a true and untrue belief, interrogates the nature of the novelistic rep of the novelistic representation. The gazelle is true or real in the author's tale, but not in Haddad's. Haddad reminds us that the words of the gazelle are true, true, at least in the sense that they are real words. The truth is first located in the gazelle's form, then her story, and finally her words. She asks Moulay to believe in her, though. These true words, much like the gazelle in the hadith, confirm her, her belief in God in her utterance of the true words of the Tawhid. Hadad seems to suggest that even if words are not always true, it, they manifest through the materiality of the word. The true gazelle is made visible in the French text only through a faith in the capacity of the French language to represent a thought that exceeds French. The gazelle travels in the story not only through translation, but in the form of a gift, a gesture of love and a material object through which the affinity of relations in the, are traced in the story. The gazelle is given as a gift twice, from Moulet to Yaminata, and from the author to his French publisher, another double, Giselle. Yaminata requests that the gazelle, the gazelle is evidence, Moulet's témoignage d'amour. The next time you return Moulet, she says, uh, I would like you to bring me a gazelle, a living gazelle. Gels, gazelles are not gazelles are not gazelles unless they are living. The gazelle, and in turn Hadad's novel, must not only be true, but also living. Haddad similarly locates the space of the desert in Yaminanta's appeal to Moulay. It was these words that left a trace in the mold hollow of an eternity, like the traces the little feet of Yaminanta left on the sand. As Yaminanta's footprints leave a trace in the story, they are marked only in the hollowed promise of the novel's unrealized publication. Indeed, the gazelle lives in the specularity of Yaminata's footsteps, Moulet's promise, the author's manuscript, and in turn the novel itself. Haddad draws a parallel between the words that evade the author and the gazelle's flight from her hunter. The author's need to grasp or indeed to bear witness to the story echoes Moulet's quest for the gazelle and the gazelle's witness to the prophet. Similarly, like Moulet, the author will present his gazelle in manuscript form to the French gazelle as Haddad will to his readers. The gazelle in this way traces the boundaries of the literary text through its readership as those who understand the words of the gazelle from the inside. After Moulet's unsuccessful hunt, the gazelle lies dying. Hadad writes, those who understand the gazelle's speech heard those words burst like a broken heart. Just as only Moulet can hear the gazelle's pain, Hadad's story can only be heard as a series of insights that formulate a set of, set of comradely relations. In presenting his gazelle, Haddad inscribes the history of Algerian deal of colonization within the potential of the gift for poetry imagined across global south. However, the gift is also a rallying cry to arms. The relationship between the author and his German lover, Gerda, with whom he shares no common language, is embodied in her gift of a harmonica, which Haddad notes speaks all languages. <laughs> Recalling Atmata's emphasis on the powerful effect of Daniar's song, which both earns Jamelia's love and awakens the narrator's own artistic conscious, consciousness, Haddad writes for this very promise of communication. It is for the good of the gazelles and the harmonicas that we fight. Read together, the novels render both authorial consciousness and the second language of their inscription from the inside. Such authorial reorientations form circuits that at once draw upon these tense colonial histories of their textual origins, as well as the humanist possibilities of their resonant visions of authorship to respond to what M. N. Roy described as the failure of philosophy, philosophy to cope with the crumbling materiality of language. The, col the colonial experience is materialized in the text exposure of the geopolitics of 1958 <laughs> on their vision of the psychic experience of the author, rendering legible the distance across these aligned and non-aligned global souths. 
In so doing, they conceive of a solidarity between a Marxist international and decolonial politics as politically engaged, not through the he hegemonic forces of geopolitical and institutional alliances, but through the effective possibilities their longing for alignment generates. In the post-Soviet moment in which the material failures of communication were also met with the collapse of the very forms of international solidarity, Haddad's charge is more prescient than ever in the longing for affiliation that lingers in the traces of harmonicas and gazelles. There's a thing worth fighting for. Bruce. You have kind of a dispassionate tone. Yes. <laughs> and it left me wondering a little bit how you how much you like the two novels that you were describing to us. Uh -huh. And also whether you think it matters. I'm, I'm assuming that you might not be wild about them, but you might they might fit into a scheme of values political values, solidarity, and so on, that you are more enthusiastic about. It's a really dumb, old-fashioned question. I just wonder whether, how alive you think these novels are for you, or would be for us, and does it matter? Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if, it, I mean, I, I, I'm interested, I'm, I think what I'm dispassionate about but also find necessary is reconciling the question of the relationship of the institutional alignments to, um, to what is happening to the, the sort of poetic dynamics between the novels. And I find, I find it necessary to expose the kind of institutional history that I think gets um, is made often invisible, and I think because we need to be, I think there's a necessity of being critical of, of precisely the ways in which the Soviet Union manipulated um, the forms of, of anti-imperial solidarity. At, at, at the same time that it's necessary to recuperate the voices from the Soviet colonial periphery itself and the way in which they in many senses contest this, the, the aims that the Soviet Union was trying to achieve. So I actually, I mean, I actually quite like the novels, but I, 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 I don't, um, I, I feel conflicted about, re, uh, about framing them so closely to this, in, this whole discussion of institutional history. Does that answer? Yeah. I have a very, I mean, a comment responding in a way that was, which was, it seemed to me, I mean, I sort of heard the talk that Bruce did, the, the flatness of the presentation, however, made it more effective for me, because I was having a very hard time uh, I wasn't saying it was ineffective. Controlling but. myself. <laughs> Just to be clear. Well, I think it's more, it's, it's more effective, it seemed to me, because the emphases came on very important lines that, so, um, you, I imagined that you must have loved the books, <laughs> but that's my imagination, my response. Hi. Oh. Were you going to ask? Let's go. Pardon? You go ahead. First, Ronald, then Don. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I like the way that you excavate for us the uh, complexities of the common terms investment uh, in political movements. It's an appropriate moment to be a certain project around, around sort of romanticizing mm -hmm. the approbation of mm -hmm. which was I like it very much. It's a thing to keep going. Mm -hmm. I want to ask, ask you to clarify something about mm -hmm. that tension. Mm -hmm. And I want to do it around both lines. Okay. 
Firstly, you remarked the way in which Ahmedo, personally I loved as, as, as a young man, yeah. living in Cairo, we would have these great um, book festivals where the Soviets would give books to us, mm -hmm. literally. And I still have my copies. But you, you talk about the way in which Jamila mm -hmm. challenges uh, historical poetry. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Say a bit more about that relationship between Bakhti, because as you know, the moment that Bakhti is writing this, the circle is very much neo-Kantian. Mm -hmm. So that's very much an engagement, not only with Lukács, mm -hmm. but with Heidegger, mm -hmm. and with Becker, mm -hmm. and with the whole German mm -hmm. discourse in which the question of of poetic form, so mm -hmm. it's the question of, of human existence, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, he's writing these things, and he's involved in the affect theory, mm -hmm. right? Which, which is, I want you to speak more about that in terms of the whole notion of evolution, mm -hmm. because he's pushing against it, which gets him sent into Central Asia, to where he's an active participant in the project of erasing the Arabic script and womanizing. Mm -hmm. So say a bit more about how you get from there yeah. To Ahmedo. I know you get there through the way in which Bhakti is mm -hmm. cynically revived in the 50s, mm -hmm. precisely in the 50s. But mm -hmm. speak more about his own conceptualization and the way in which he's only thinking about this, which is used by a number of people, mm -hmm. including Khoni, mm -hmm. you know, uh, later on. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know that the Ghazal and Ghazal are the same thing, they're not even the same words, yeah. right? No, yeah. Ghazal is a very specific problem. Yeah. You know, Malik Haddad is a problematic figure. Yeah. And particularly his remark about if it was transported in Arabic, which uh -huh. goes to the crux of what you're, you're trying to speak to, yeah. right? Because he's a mm -hmm. writing in French, at a moment in which Arabic is emerging as an imperial language, mm -hmm. right? To go against the Hamani mm -hmm. that can speak many languages. Mm -hmm. so, so if you could, and just as a side thing, Khoni picks up the gazelle and turns it into a goat. No, because there's a motif, uh -huh. Aisha throughout the Sahel, uh -huh. if you will, the south, the, the Arab south, you know, of, of these creatures as Afrit, as, uh -huh. as Right, creatures. yeah. Well, that's a great question. I, um, I think, like, I, I think the, there's two, there's two sort of historical poetic movements, but what, I mean, I'm, I'm also referencing the, the very recent, uh, uh, popularization, repopularization of, of historical poetics, which which um, which goes back to which reads it as reading itself as 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 a um, a, uh, a theory of affect, but of course it's it's precisely centered around a very specific canon, mm -hmm. and these thinkers who are coming out of like a, lar a larger genealogy of of, um, of ethnologers, right? Um, not not only ethnographers, not only linguists, but those who are blending the two are are using it to to in to generate a vision of Eurasian totality, which is based on a th on on absolutely on on visions of um, of uh, of non-Darwinian biology that are coming out of Goethe and this vision that the, that the languages are all evolving toward a single convergence within a single whole. Mm. Um, and in, in Atmatov's work uh, more broadly, he's, he's very concerned with the relationship between the environment and, um, and uh, as, a, as a form of resist the, the destruction of the environment by, by the Soviet Union, even though I mean, he's being He's also, you know, being employed by the Soviet state. But of course, he's writing about he's writing from from Kazakhstan about um, about the, the ecological destruction of the region, and um, and and this I'm reading as absolutely a, a mode of contesting this sort of this vision that flies under the under under the idea of of biological diversity, but is actually one of supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm reading a kind of um, an ecological critique that emerges from his his other work more broadly, um, in in which I think um, language is 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 something that uh, that grows in the space but does not converge in t towards some greater singular Soviet whole. 
it's something that that um, that grows in many different ways and, and kind of uh, the, again this notion of stevushaya it spreads out like moss maybe or something like this would be a better analogy um, uh, and of course, uh, as you mentioned, the, 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 the project to homogenize Soviet script in the 20s earlier, right, um, in terms of a way of, again, promoting the diversity of different national languages, uh, while at the same time forcing them to, um, to uh, convene around uh, the erasure that the Latin script performs on the Arabic script. So there is certainly um, a, a 1920s analog to the way in which um, the dominant force of the Soviet Union is trying to to create a sort of totality. But I am in, interested in recuperating these sort of histories of what happens despite the project, despite d despite the, the 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 bounded project of the Soviet of the Soviet um, multicultural project. What happens despite it? against it and through it and the kind of connections that occur through it. But there's still, I'm sorry, mm, yes. this problem of mediation, how do you yeah. get from, from Ahmedov to Hadad? Right. You get there through Gorky uh, and you get there through Ahmedov. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so you're right, you still have the problem of these mediating institutions that are right. still pursuing a very ethological. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the question for me is a is 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 or the project is is one of trying to mobilize the novels against that event against the very institutionality that connects mm -hmm. them. Um, and then on the, on the Bakhtin point, there's also the issue of I mean Bakhtin is Bakhtin's, Bakhtin's uh, very interested in in. Um, in in, in, in in Russian Orthodox conceptions of like the articulation of the utterance, so it very much has, um, it's very much tied to, uh, I mean, of course, this is what got him sent to Kazakhstan, right? It's very much tied to a a, 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 a very poetic, um, a deeply uh, spiritual incantation. The notion of performance, which for him is tied to, to to um, uh, this the the sort of ecstatic origins of the utterance itself. Am I getting toward what you were asking? Yes. Okay. Uh, talk later, okay. Yeah. Questions? Thanks. Yes. Mine, I guess, is simple when it's related to your last point, and how the poetics would work against the institutionalities mm -hmm. that uh, connect the various constituencies. Once you have a poetics of longing. Mm -hmm. What is it that would sustain um, an affiliation that could be reproduced mm -hmm. or repeated um, when um, longing um, as such uh, does not necessarily have uh, any uh, specific affiliation mm -hmm. uh, to tether the longing to? Once, once the longing mm -hmm. uh, becomes associated um, with a figure with whom the longing can be affiliated, then the, what you call the ecstasy of the longing uh, is, uh, in, at that moment, deadened. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it's, if it's sheer invocation, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, affiliation would, uh, would also uh, be uh, shattered, would it not? Mm -hmm. I think affiliation, I mean, the idea is an affiliation in its institutional capacities, yes. But an affiliation that could speak to, I mean, perhaps part of this is, is also uh, the idea of like what, what the reconstruction of this archive might do at this moment in time. But at the right. very moment in which you, you can uh, say that it's an affiliation mm -hmm. that is uh, external to the institutionalized mm -hmm. affiliations, you have a have a predictability of reading, a protocol of reading that would sustain um, mm -hmm. that affiliation. That mm -hmm. is, um, let's call it pre-institutional. That is, it, it would always uh, presuppose that once it once it exists a protocol mm -hmm. uh, that can be consistently uh, reproduced, uh, then it's functioning as a, a proto-institution. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if if the affiliations are to um, the predictable, 
mm -hmm. uh, as uh, a, a structure of relations that works outside uh, the, the orthodoxy, the already predetermined ones. Uh, that that is still functioning as as an institution, as institutional formation, in formation, is it not? I mean, I, I still think that uh, um, I think that there's there's something to be said about constructing a set of affiliations. Like I'm, if I am constructing a set of affiliation performatively in the text, I mean, I could, I could offer you a set of um, a really, I should, I could offer like a set of poetic resonances between writers that are with both within this, a space of time. That I, could, I could offer you like a, a, an, a historical meeting between figures, right, or a citation. But I think the 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 idea is that is that there is a. There's a possibility for um, in 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 revisiting the the archive and the connections that were not made. There's a way of performing a different type of um, a different type or revealing a different type of set resonances between them that did not that that were not possible within this formation. It, it, it's a it's 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 a um, it's a it's a questioning of what would have been what might have been possible, what meetings might have happened, and and how and and, and the ways and what and what those meetings suggest to us about the question of alignment and its possibilities. Sorry, just a quick follow up. Well, we are already into the next session, <laughs> so maybe we, if possible, could hold the question for a general discussion. The answer can't be as quick as the question. So can we break? Thank you very much.